This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we talk about what it's like to be a Christian Monday through Saturday, to live as a person of faith in a culture against faith. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk. I'm excited to be here with my friend, Andrew Barrett. Andrew is the pastor. Andrew's the pastor of uh, Trinity Baptist Church in Newton, North Carolina. Uh, We've been friends for, I don't know, when did we meet? 2015? I've been with Sarah for going on six years. So we've been friends for a little over five years then. Yeah. So we've been friends for a long time. Andrew went up to Truett Seminary to do his MDiv uh, before me, and therefore he just graduated last semester and got his job and moved to North Carolina to be away from us, and I'm very angry about it, but it happens. But thanks to technology, we get to do stuff like this. And uh, in our first episode of Cancel Culture on Let's Talk, Andrew started posting in the comments about just some interesting thoughts he had. And, and that carried over into a conversation that he and I had uh, out of the comments, just in text message. And we were like, hey, we should turn this into an episode. So it's really interesting because what we're going to do today is we're going to look at cancel culture in light of the Christian story. Because there are some things that have happened throughout Christendom that I think are quite um, interesting in light of cancel culture uh, for where we are today. So Andrew had this great um, understanding of how cancel culture arose and what its goal and motive was that is impactful and valuable for this conversation. So Andrew, why don't you tell us what that is? Was I the first official My Wellhouse YouTube commenter? I was wondering that when I posted. I was like, am I the first one? No, you're not the first one, but... Um, you well, so we get the spam comments all the time. Right, right. The but the, the explicit the actual, sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But we do we do have a few people that comment somewhat regularly on a few different posts. Um, so you were not the first, but you were like the top one of the top five. Great. I'll settle for top five. Yeah. Um, to to what you asked me to talk about, uh, I think it's important because it will help assess what are perhaps some problems with cancel culture to recognize that the reason it started, and of course we didn't call it cancel culture. In fact, what we called it was the Me Too movement because I think that their origins, their etiologies, if you'd like to use an academic term, is they're parallel perhaps, but they're also synonymous. So they're, they're one and yet two. But the idea was that the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, the Bill Cosbys of the world, who I think represent, at least in pop culture, the big two, so let alone the church two movement. Right. The idea was that the reason they were in a position to commit these crimes against uh, some women, in Cosby's case, over 50 was because they held positions of influence and power. And so the idea behind, quote unquote, canceling them was that these people need to be removed from the atmosphere in which they were able to commit these crimes. So the reason that you can leverage actresses into having sex with you was because you hold control over their career and over their availability to be in movies because you're Harvey Weinstein. And then same goes for Bill Cosby. You can do that because you're you're Bill Cosby. But he also did some things behind their back, too. Sometimes it wasn't necessarily yeah. leverage. But you get the point. The idea is like, OK, if the environment within which this is happening is because you are a person of power and influence, you shouldn't be allowed to have that kind of power and influence anymore. Right. This is cute. Some folks will have to forgive me, but think about. Uncle Ben telling Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. And if you're going to use that power to commit these heinous crimes against other human beings, then you're clearly not up to the task and you need to be removed from that spot. But what evolved from that, even from perfectly well-meaning people, was just 
that became a popular, a popularized thing. So now nobody is safe, right? right? People, people like me, who's just some Joe in Catawba County, North Carolina, is forever whatever the worst mistake in my life was. And that's where we start getting into the unhealthy realms of cancel culture is when everything is a cancelable offense and everyone is a cancelable candidate. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that plays off the episode we talked about last time. Cancel culture has become um, an excuse for people to forget the need for grace. And that's shown up in the church as well, right? Now, there are some instances, you know, you didn't mention the church to movement in depth, but there are some instances there where, yeah, I think there, there is a unique set of circumstances uh, that I think we're going to talk about in light. Uh, I think you said earlier that there are some things that have happened and there's grace for that. They can be forgiven, but they're not necessarily to be forgotten. And I think there's biblical precedent for that. Yeah. So like, give us some examples. So it was interesting to just be practicing my personal Bible reading while we were planning for this conversation, because I'm, I'm back to square one started from Genesis again. And when I was reading Genesis chapter four about Cain murdering Abel and what ensued after that, look, clearly cancel culture is anachronistic here, but there was still an interesting connection. So what happens? Cain kills Abel. We'll do the mini, the mini storyline here. And God exiles Cain. Well, Cain's fear is that he's a, he's a dead man walking, that he's going to go wherever he's being cast out to. And not, not much longer after getting there, is he going to be killed? We might call that being canceled which right. is not a perfect analogy, but maybe your listeners will just roll with me here. But well, God they're going to have to because we, we use the same analogy for Jesus being canceled. So they're going to, yeah, it's fine. Right. So God doesn't kill him, number one, and isn't going to let him be killed, number two. But what God does do is marks him. Yeah. And I take that mark among a number of things to just be kind of an indicator of there are there are some mistakes i think we'll get into this later i say mistakes some crimes are committed on purpose we can't call them mistakes there are some of these crimes that are so heinous you get to move on you get to live and cain got to live and he got married and he had children and we will leave alone the character of said children because lamech was not a great guy but still he got to do that but he also was branded for what he did to his brother for the rest of his life. Yeah. And so sometimes, oftentimes, especially, yeah, if you're kind of our big two guys that we've talked about so far, the Weinsteins and the Cosbys of the world, you get to live, you get to be alive. Now, you may have to be in jail. And in Cosby's case, I think parts of your legacy get to be preserved for the astronomical contribution he made to the black community. Right. But you don't get to just move on from the fact that you committed these crimes against 52, right, women? Is it yeah, 52? at least it, at the time of Dave Chappelle's recording, it was 52. Now, if you look it up, it's uh, a very ambiguous more than 60. Right. So nobody's going to forget about that. And even the most forgiving people and the most kind of devil's advocate perspectives would be remiss, if not outright foolish, to be like, well, forget about all those rapes because here's what he did in his career. But not all of these crimes are created equal. No, it's true. Uh, They're not all, they're they're not all created equal, but I do think uh, another element of it is, is in this idea of being forgiven and not forgotten, we also can't miss the narrative in the Old Testament about people being named nations after individuals. For instance, if you don't know the people of Moab, the Moabites, which lovely Ruth comes from, well, Moab is actually one of the sons from Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughter in Genesis 19 or 20. Well, 
by being called a Moabite, you don't get to forget that heinous thing, but you're also not held uh, to the standard of actually doing it right. Our actions, they come with being remembered and they're not all created equal, right? Ruth didn't do anything wrong to be a Moabite. She didn't have any control over that, but there's still some things that are just not forgotten in the same way. Bill Cosby's children, that's not going anywhere for them. It's still, it's still going to be carried with them. I will say, and we talked about this just in preparing for this podcast, this video, that my, what was my joke? That uh, felons and ex-cons, they were victims of cancel culture before it was cool. Yeah. I mean, just by virtue of me calling them ex-convicts and not people. Yeah. And uh, we've got a congregant. Her name is Kelly. Hi, Kelly. I don't know if you'll ever get around to watching this. Uh, <laughs> she works in the Career Center for Goodwill, who they are, who their titles say they are. They help various demographics start careers and not necessarily with Goodwill. That was something I learned when she was telling me that. It's stuff like putting resumes together, helping set up interviews, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. But their kind of three target demographics are the homeless, veterans, and ex-cons. Because, man, the moment you do time, you are at a lifelong disadvantage in the oh, workforce. Yeah. And it's actually quite the blemish. I don't know if you call it a blemish on the justice system, but just a blemish on the idea in general that once you do your time, well, you've done your time and you're free to reenter society and become a contributor. And it's like, well, not really. Right. Because, I mean, imagine just you and, and you and I know each other at a pretty personal level. Imagine being yeah. branded for the worst mistake you ever committed in your life for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right? I, yeah, I don't think that there are very few people who would think that I should be a pastor. Right. I mean, it's, just, it's just one of those things. I mean, we all do think, especially if you reach back into your younger years where you're learning and you're you're trying to figure out life and stress and being an adult and all those things, you do some really stupid things. Right. And, and if you had to carry that forever, yeah, I just, life would be very different for me. And I think that's one of the, and we'll get into biblical implications because I know you want to, but that's one of the elements of so-called cancel culture where Christians should be a little more thoughtful in their participation yeah. is the idea that no part of your life is safe. So this is, this is a cute example, and I hope that folks will put up with me, but you know, if you made some racial joke when you were 12 on your MySpace account, and we find those MySpace posts, you're going to have to answer that, answer for that now in your mid to late 20s. And what's worse is if you go to apologize for that and explain that it was just a joke and you didn't know better and you're sorry, I'm going to say, I don't believe you. And I just yeah. think that that's something you have to say to save face. Yeah, I, I can't help but be reminded of, so Andrew, you and I both, went to Baylor slash go to Baylor and are pretty avid football fans. And we just did some coaching changes to our staff um, on the offensive side. And we poached Jeff Grimes, the offensive coordinator for BYU. And in that we had made Jeff Grimes, the offensive coordinator, and he wanted to hire an offensive line coach, which if you watched Baylor football last year, it needed to happen. It was terrible. We made a, we made a hire. And we announced the hire. Everything was good. And then like three days later, Coach Dave Aranda comes out and is like, yeah, we're going in a different direction. It's like, oh, wait, what happened? Well, apparently someone had found a picture of this offensive line coach when he was in college at the University of Auburn at a party 12 years earlier at a Halloween party going as blackface. It's like, oh, yeah, he was booted out and we made a new hire. Um, Twelve years ago in college, this plagued an opportunity for him. He was from a group of five school. So the ability to potentially make that jump to a power five, to a big 12 conference school, you know, it, 
it was it didn't happen for him and it may never happen for him now and nobody is saying nobody's trying to whitewash and that's a deliberate pun right that he did blackface no one's like oh come on it's just blackface that people right. used to do yeah. it all the time like yeah. nobody's saying that yeah, but nobody's was, minimizing right. what happened. That was 12 years ago. Yeah. And it's just this weird, no one is safe and no time is safe. But and in particular, you are not allowed to grow up. Yeah. And be sorry. Yeah. You know, and, and if you try to be sorry, all I'm going to think is that, and part of this is just social media culture, that saving face has become such a prominent part of these uh, popular careers. But yeah, I'm right. just going to think you're just saying that because you have to, or worse, because the school is forcing you to, like, you don't actually mean it. You know what you did. Right. War Eagle, by the way. Yeah. That yeah. Party. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you would, that would be the thing you'd take out of that story. <laughs> of course. At an Auburn party. My gosh. Couldn't yeah. be at a Georgia party or a Bama yeah. party. It had to be at an Auburn party. Had to be at an Auburn party. Well, you For know, those who Auburn. don't know, I'm a very big Auburn Tigers fan. So, yeah. yikes. Yeah. Well, Auburn's the SEC school, SEC school for misfits, right? You did, you did take Cam Newton again after he <laughs> did all that stuff in Florida. And stole my sister-in-law's bike at Blake College. <laughs> I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, I was telling uh, uh, my sister-in-law Haley uh, went to Blinn College in Brenham, which is their main campus, and that's where Cam Newton was in between Florida and Auburn. And when I was talking to her about how much I loved Auburn and was a fan of Cam Newton, she said that guy stole my bike in college. <laughs> I was like, well, he bought stolen computers too. So sometimes you get what you pay for. Uh, That's hilarious. I had yep. forgot that he stole Haley's bike. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so funny. All right. So um, do you want to jump into um, some Bible passages or do we want to reach back into church history first? Because I think, I think there's some interesting pieces on both sides. I think we can start with the Bible and work our way forward. Well, no, let's start with just a couple of prominent church history notes, and then we can yeah. go back to the scriptures. Yeah, so I think when if we I track was just, it backwards, it, yeah. it'll work well. When I was just jotting down a couple of people, because I really wanted to focus on prominent theologians who hold a lot of influence over current theological traditions, and the thing that kind of spurred these notes was what we've said about Bill Cosby, for example, how do Christians navigate or just people? Because I think most at least thoughtful folks understand what Cosby has done for the black community. Excuse me. I got one of those air burps. Yeah, I got you. And so it's how do you navigate holding someone accountable for, yeah, in the case of Cosby, a true crime against humanity. Yeah. While also trying to balance that with, their very meaningful contributions to society, to a certain demographic of people, but also the way Cosby changed entertainment with his putting out good black cartoons that were made by black people. Right. How do you hold those things in the balance? Because it's an important question for Christians to answer because that's a part of our heritage, Protestant or Catholic, and we're Protestants. So we'll look at it from a Protestant lens and we can start with Martin Luther. Yeah. Martin Luther is the reason we have Protestant traditions, one of them anyway. He rescued the church, in my opinion, from a very dangerous trend toward what the current medieval Catholic church, so not the Catholic church now, we're not going to broad brush and act like Vatican right. II didn't happen, but what the medieval Catholic church was advocating behind their system of indulgences and the way that they were totally manipulating people's fears and uncertainties about themselves or their loved ones, all to accommodate their greed. It's all that it was. Yeah. And, and we, should, was, we would be remiss if we didn't also acknowledge that you can still receive an indulgence from the Catholic Church today. You just can't pay for it. Right. 
That's the difference. You right. can't they don't buy have, the indulgence. I can't remember the name of the guy, but they don't have folks going around with the indulgence cart in your right. towns. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's him. And that was really the catalyst for him uh, to put the 95 theses on the door, those sorts of things. Yep. But as a lot of folks will know, and perhaps a lot of your listenership will know, toward the end of his life, he was spouting off some deeply anti-Semitic propaganda. Yep. And I read a really helpful article that said it was less racial and more theological. That's fine. And that's a conversation for a different pod. But be that as it may, here's where I'll start. One of the things that Luther advocated for, and this was not unique to him in the sense that Germany in and of itself at the time just had beef with the Jews. You've got these Christian nation states who aren't pleased that Jews, well, won't accept Christ. And so Luther's a part of that, but he advocated these things called sharp mercies, and there are seven of them. I'll read them one to seven, and you and the listenership can decide which of these sound familiar. The first was to burn down their schools and synagogues. Keep in mind, he thinks these are acts of mercy, you know, the same way exile is God's source of judgment and punishment, but also his arena for mercy. I think that's what Luther probably thought he was doing with this. So burn schools and synagogues. The second was transfer Jews to community settlements. The third was confiscate Jewish literature. So Talmudic uh, literature, Hebrew Bible. The fourth was prohibit rabbis from teaching. The fifth was to deny Jews safe con uh, conduct, safe passage, basically that cops turn blind eyes to things that happen to Jews or Jewish communities. The sixth was to appropriate their wealth. And then the seventh was to enforce manual labor as penance for not accepting Christ or trying to Judaize Christians. Either way, if you do enough work, will forgive you. But ultimately, what Luther and a great many Germans want was to expel Jews from the German nation state, period. Yeah. That's all legit. And even the most sympathetic Luther scholars will admit that that is legit. And there are ways, there are ways to nuance it, but we don't want this conversation to suffer the slow death of a thousand nuances. Right. But think about points two and seven in particular transfer Jews to community settlements. A few centuries later, we'd call those ghettos. And then the seventh was manual labor as penance. Well, if you're somebody thinking about how you want to structure a concentration camp, those are two of your building blocks. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, our listeners can remember when we had my friend Adam Cheney come on here, Adam talks about the first step in oppressing any people group is to take away their voice. And that's also in the building blocks, taking away their literature, refusing to let rabbis teach, burning down their schools. You're doing everything to oppress them to the point of ultimate vulnerability that you can extract them into isolated camps and communities. Now, the, the pretty terrifying thing is that he, again, he thought these were mercies. He thought this was a way to compel Jews to have ears to hear the gospel. That's not quite how I'd do it. <laughs> right. but that's, that's horrendous. Yeah. Right. But that's also Martin Luther. Yeah. And so Lutheranism continues to be alive and well as a Protestant tradition in the United States. In fact, uh, Catawba County in general, but Hickory in particular, uh, North Carolina, is a German settlement. There's Lutheran churches on every corner. And yeah. Lenore Ryan University, our small private, private college here, it's a Lutheran university. Yeah. So his heritage, his influence is very long lasting. And even the likes of Baptist and Methodists and so forth, any Protestant tradition owes at least a semblance of their existence to this guy. Yeah, without a doubt. It, we, we the world would look radically different without Martin Luther. The world itself, I mean, also, we shouldn't forget that originally the hospital systems came through the church. One of the largest hospitals in Houston and the specialist hospital for cardiac 
is St. Luke's Hospital. It is a Lutheran institution. That's just fun pushback for this whole, you know, what have you done for me lately attitude that some people take toward the church. This is a digression, but it's one that I relish making the whole like, what have you, what's the church done, but bad. It's like, do you like hospitals? Yeah. Do you like schools or retirement or nursing facilities where people can live out their, their olden days in dignity instead of just, you know, putting them down like the elderly family dog. It's like, oh, you do, you do like those things. Do you like adoption agencies? Okay. Yep. Well, that's all the church. Yeah. Besides that, I don't know what we've done. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, um, no real contributions to society at all, you know. Yeah, other than that, yeah, just a, basically the Crusades and then nothing else. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I do think that that Martin Luther is a great a great point, a great example because had we held Martin accountable and for his greatest mistake, and because I do think that one might be it might be a gray area but i do think you can call it mistake because martin had a a poor reading theologically in that area but does that negate are we going to now all because these listeners are going to take it and run it through are there going to be babylon b headlines now about this and are we going to try to cancel martin luther or no. lutheranism or the idea that we're saved by grace through faith yeah, that's another one, right? So every Protestant tradition says that, right? Sola fide, saved by grace through faith alone. And it's it's this really weird thing that if, if we were going to hold someone of this level of influence and trajectory on the course of the world, we would all be very different people. Same with John Calvin. Right. So Calvin's big blemish, besides just folks who are angry about Calvinism, his big blemish is what happened to uh, the Spanish physician Cervantes uh, while he was, when he made the pretty horrible error of walking, passing through Calvin's Geneva. So I took, I took some notes just about how that went down. So as not to sound uninformed, uh, <laughs> this is from Justo Gonzalez's church history. Yeah, that's a great But book. Cervantes was actually a, an escapee. He was imprisoned by the Roman Catholics at the time and had managed to escape. But his two crimes, the reason why he was in trouble was first— And this is kind of ironic, particularly as Baptist. He argued that the union of church and state was apostasy. Okay. He was like, well, uh, good for you, Cervantes. (laughs) Because, I mean, (laughs) at the time, that was a devastating. I mean, there was no such thing, particularly in Geneva. But, I mean, after Constantine, church and state were like this. Yeah. But he also, and this one, you can't quite tip the cap to him. He suggested that the Council of Nicaea's articulation of the doctrine of the Trinity was offensive to God. So he had beef okay. with the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's like, yikes, you had me till there. Yeah, but that's so an he interesting was, one. But there, are, we also would be remiss if we didn't say that a lot of people have had beef with that idea yeah. and doctrine. So, so he, this is from my notes, he was imprisoned by the French... Roman Catholic Church at the time, and he escaped. But while he was passing through Geneva, he was recognized and then imprisoned. And after some deliberation, and keep in mind, there's a reason we call it Calvin's Geneva. Uh, This was a a governmental, you know, kind of religio, religio political system that was totally his conception. And they captured him and they burned him. Yep. And, you know, the kind of alive. The kind of funny, yeah, but that some people get is, yeah, but Calvin wanted to cut his head off, which admittedly is more humane than being burned alive. But the idea was you capture a theological heretic and you kill a theological heretic. And this is one of those moments, maybe the same with Luther, where you do have to ask the question, are people allowed to, and I'm going to use this word and people may not like it, are people allowed to be a victim of historical context? Yeah. 
And what I mean by that is, and it doesn't make it right. It's kind of like the blackface thing, but that's what everybody was doing. Right. You were just killing heretics. And Luther was hardly unique in having beef with the Jews. And so at what point do we acknowledge, not in an apologetic way, this is not an apologetic for Luther's anti-Semitic rhetoric or for Calvin's murdering people for theological disputes. It's not an apology for that. But at what point are folks allowed to be as Curly from the Three Stooges would say, a victim of circumstance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And, you know, we didn't even we didn't even mention that there are a number of different pastors and theologians around the same time that are drowning people for differing views of baptism. Yeah. Oh, you want to be rebaptized? OK, well, we're going to yeah, yeah. put a we're rock gonna... around your ankle and throw you in a river. Yeah, we're going to literally kill you because that's not what we want. Um and so it is, it is this question of how much do you hold someone accountable for a question of circumstance? Because at least back then, everybody was doing that. Um, and, and it's really hard to fathom that because now we look at that and go, any, any kind of activity against the image of God, we would just say it's heinous, right? Um, and we don't, we don't have that now, but you know, what, if, what if we get 400 years down the road and people start coming back going, man, there were all these pastors that were like oppressing the position of women in the church, right? It's like, oh, we can't have that. Well, but like, well, in culture right now, in our contemporary society, people are pretty split on that. I think we're both very affirming of women. And so I can, I can pick on that position, but that's we're we're not the majority in the church and in, in most traditions that we give that position to women. And so how that question, how much do we hold people accountable for their circumstance? When you look around and everybody is doing something, well, what happens now? Dr. Rebecca Pohays at Truett has, I've always appreciated her perspective on just coming up as a woman who felt called to ministry and to teach and preach. And she would talk about, and I also, um, I forget her last name, but Mary Alice, I can't remember her last name. She's in, uh, I think Highland Baptist church in Louisville now, but yeah, in fact, it was her who would say it talking about people loved her and supported her how they knew how. Are you looking up her last name? Yeah. 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 I can't remember. I should. I've heard her preach, but she I've always appreciated that line of thought that people loved and supported her how they knew how to that Bird they Wistow? just could say what Mary Alice Bird was still Bird was. Yes, that sounds right. Yeah, this is small world stuff. Highland Baptist Church. Now that church has changed dramatically since then, and yeah. that's where I'll stop. But that is where my dad went to church while he was oh, studying wow. at Southern Seminary. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very liturgical Baptist church. Um, yeah, small world. Yeah. Uh, they supported her how they knew how. So it's acknowledging that, look, their failure to just fully support her calling was not good, but they were doing the best they could. Right. And that's part. And there would be, there are many people, though, and I am not a woman in ministry. So just in case you were wondering, yeah. <laughs> but there are many women who they really have to wrestle with, at least from my view, some serious bitterness because yeah. they weren't able to have that kind of perspective. And sometimes it's because it wasn't even they supported me how they knew how it was. They did not support me, period. And so that not just becomes all. this very painful memory to people. And there's no grace there. And sometimes right. there shouldn't be particularly in the Baptist world, but I have always really appreciated um, Mary Alice's perspective on that. You want to jump over to some Bible folk? Yeah, man, I love some Bible. I love me some Bible stories. So hit me with them. Well, I want to mainly stick with two and a third, if we can get to it, biblical characters who committed what we would consider cancelable offenses. Yeah. Because I think what that will help us with 
you know, the kind of guiding point for us wanting to do this pod was balancing legacy with blemishes. Right. And two of two of arguably the four most important characters of scripture. Well, no, three of the four. It's just if we can get to the third of arguably the most important characters of scripture committed these cancelable offenses. And we yeah. can start first with good old Father Abraham. Yep. And when we were talking about this before we filmed the pod, the two, it's the same crime that he commits twice of totally putting Sarah out to pasture to save yeah. his own skin. He does it in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis chapter 20 with Pharaoh and then King Absalom tells her to say you're my sister so that they won't kill him and steal his wife. But what that entails is surrendering her to the royal harem. Yeah. And Lord knows what goes on in these ancient Near Eastern royal harems. But I bet, let's just put it this way. I don't think there were a ton of gentlemen yeah. running, those, running those systems. But Abraham just totally puts his wife out there to do that. And not going to win, not going to win husband of the year anytime soon. This is only the mother of the covenant that right. you're surrendering over. I mean, it's actually got pretty enormous implications for just the biblical story too. It's like here's this oh, yeah. mother of Isaac, mother of the covenant people, who Abraham's like, here, take her, just don't kill me. Yeah. But he's also Abraham. Yeah, who Paul and the New Testament writers refer to time and again as the point person where this whole thing started. Genesis 1 through 11 is kind of a diagnosis of the issue, particularly 3 through 11. You get right. the fall. You get how that influences the family in Genesis 4. You get how that influences the world with the flood. And then finally, you get kind of the high point with Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. And then Genesis 12 with this fella named Abram is where the show gets started and right. salvation begins. And the New Testament writers all look to that and look to him and say that he he was counted as righteous because of his faith and because he was, so all of us, because of our faith, are brought, brought into his family. Right. But don't take, uh, don't take marriage advice from him. Not, not even a little bit. No, don't. Um, and it's interesting, right? Because, you know, you're talking about it. When we talk about patriarchs of the faith, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those guys. Very rarely do people go back to Adam. And the only time they do, it's when they're talking about sin and sin entering the world. Um, I will say that I do believe it's um, Luke's genealogy that it goes back to Adam. Um, so there is that one instance where he traces it all the way back to Adam. But by and large, everybody goes back to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And Abraham's kind of where the buck stops. And it's like, we even sing songs about it, right? To our little kids in VBS, like Father Abraham. Yep. It, it's just, he is the father of the faith in the eyes of the scriptures. I'll bring up the other guy and then we can talk about the way the Bible even encourages us to hold both things in the balance. And the second and probably the most obvious for many listeners is King David. Oh yeah. King David, uh, second Samuel 11, Bathsheba. And we will not call this an affair. I even hesitate to call it adultery, even though I guess it technically fits the bill. It was bona fide sexual assault. Yeah. And we need to be careful not to anachronistically impose ideas of consent in the whole, it takes two things. It takes two to tango because that may be true now, but it certainly wasn't true then. You don't decline the king's request to come to his quarters, and you right. certainly don't decline whatever the king wants to do once you get there. He wasn't even supposed to be at home when he saw her on his rooftop on her rooftop in the first place. Yeah. So this is sexual assault. Yeah, right? I would agree with you for sure, 100%. And I would even say that in a close reading of the text, it's set up how we would think about it now in light of Me Too. David is not where he's supposed to be. It was he's a time the, when kings went out to war, and David right. is sitting on the couch. He's sitting on the couch. He gets up and goes to the roof of the palace where he can see things from his position of power that he shouldn't be able to see. He sees Bathsheba undergoing a cleansing ritual. 
And then he tells his goons, go get her, not go ask her to come see me, go invite her. It's go get her and bring her to me. Bathsheba throughout the entire narrative is 100% passive in the story. That's and a that's, good point. that's not unique or sorry, that is unique because there are lots of times in biblical narrative where we see women being active. We would be remiss to talk about how Rebecca encourages Jacob to steal the birthright. Women are active yeah. in the biblical narrative. Bathsheba is not. Well, and Bathsheba will be in First Kings when she's advocating oh. for Solomon to receive his rightful heirship. Yep, so that contrast kind of strengthens your point that we see her be active elsewhere, but here she's totally on the passive end. The New Testament kind of preserves that too, because in Jesus' genealogy, she's just called the wife the of wife Uriah. Of, yep, the wife of Uriah. But so David does that to her and then does what he completely ruins her family life because, you know, oh, yeah. he tries to bring Uriah home from war. And of course, Uriah is kind of the foil to David's character because he's the honorable man with integrity. Yeah, he's the man that David's supposed yeah. to be in the narrative. He, he won't lie with his wife because that's David's way of trying to cover up for his crimes. Uh, yep. We won't get into why he wanted her to have to sleep with his wife. Otherwise, we'd have to make this explicit. But uh yeah let those who have ears hear. So he does that. Not much longer after that, he also ain't going to win. So he's not going to win king of the year points for that. He's not going to win husband of the year points for that or bro of the year points for that. Right. And then not yeah. much longer, he, he loses points for father of the year too. Yep. When his son Amnon incestuously rapes his daughter, his, or his sister, David's daughter, Tamar. And the scripture to be fair says that David was mad but I'd hope he'd be mad. Yeah, <laughs> that's as far as the scale goes, that's the minimum of threshold of response. Yeah, good for you. It's like the old Chris Rock bit. Are you expecting me to thank you for doing what you were supposed to do? Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah. But then that's kind of where it stops. And it's actually Absalom who has to take up the mantle of, oh, I don't know, doing something about what Amnon did. Right. And of course, Absalom kills Amnon, but then David mourns Amnon. Right. Which it was his son. Sure. But it's just a weird, when's David going to overreact? When's David going to underreact? And a lot of right. folks would look at that and be like, boy, you, not how I'd handle someone doing that to my daughter, but knock yourself right. out, man. But this is King <laughs> David. Yeah. And so here's, here's why he's helpful to this conversation. You know, if, if you don't have a high view of Biblical inspiration, this won't mean anything to you, not you, but listeners. Yeah. But think about anyone who'll say that God inspired the contents and the organizations of the scriptures. So David is Israel's quintessential king. And in fact, in First and Second Kings and in Chronicles, they will often end the narrative of some other king or begin it. I mean, excuse me, they'll begin the narrative of some other king by bouncing them off of David. Right. So they're either faithful like David was or unfaithful like David was. So he's right. the bar. And 2 Samuel 7 is one of those covenant promises that persists across the entire narrative of Scripture. And when Matthew begins his gospel, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, this is the beginning of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And then yeah. you go to Romans chapter 1, for example, and David's lumped right in there with Jesus' heritage. And yet those stories of what he did are also in the scriptures. Yeah. God, if you want to word it, perhaps over simply, God wanted those things to stay in the scriptures. Right. And that's just a helpful teaching point for pastors about be careful with your be like so-and-so sermons. Right. Yeah. <laughs> be like David, yeah. unless you're a husband or a leader or a father. Otherwise, a, be a like a human David. being. Yeah. yeah. A human being. <laughs> David is also responsible either because of his just Davidic tradition or because of his own penmanship for the Psalms, which have been the prayer book of Christians since, I don't know, the very time they were written. Right. But we never in the scriptures won't allow us to lose sight of this gross crime that he committed against Bathsheba. He totally ruined her life. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, spare me the, oh yeah, you only get to become the king's wife and the queen mother. It's like, yeah, at the expense of her family, well, it's not also, we also shouldn't forget that there's like maybe a thousand of them 
that are his wife's or concubines or women around that David can and chooses to sleep with? Right. I'm not totally sure that being the king's wife is a once in a lifetime opportunity for David or Solomon. Right. But so the scriptures will not allow us to do two things, particularly with King David. They will not allow us to cancel him. Nope. And, and, and really, it's not so much David that is at the threat of being canceled. It's that God will not be canceled, right? Yeah. So just for the sake of being biblically sound here, that it's, it's God who's faithful to his covenant with Abraham when Abraham isn't. It's God who's faithful to the Davidic covenant when, when David and his ancestors aren't. So that's there. But it won't let us let David out of our sight. Yeah. But it also won't let us forget what he did. Yeah. And we don't have to act like it was right. Yeah. Well, and there's a unique thing. This has always fascinated me as I've studied and read those narratives of David. David gets a very, not only a unique promise in the coming lineage of the Messiah, David gets a unique name or title or epithet that nobody else gets in the scriptures. A man after God's own heart. Now, there are a lot of people called righteous. There are a lot of people called blameless. There are a lot of people that get these very high, lofty praises in Scripture. But David gets one like nobody else. And I got to say, if I'm just looking at it, I probably kind of want to be the guy that's called a man after God's own heart rather than blameless or righteous because it's more unique. It's, it's something special. But yet you look at it and it's like, well, actually, this dude was a terrible person. And what do we do with it? What do, what do we do? Well, it forces us to remember that as much as sometimes we don't want to be, we are a product of and a people of grace. It can't be removed. The narrative of who we are as Christians doesn't exist without us both being receivers of grace and laterally distributors of grace. Mm. Well, and we alluded to it, and this may be a bit of an over, oversimplification. If you cancel David, you don't get Jesus. Yep. You know, we quoted Matthew 1, verse 1. What proceeds from that is a genealogy tracing Jesus through the exile to, da you know, the high points of this are Abraham to David, David to exile, exile, exile to Jesus. To, yep. So if we can't, you know, cancel, whatever that means, Abraham or David for their true to form crimes, not calling either of them mistakes, you know, is this a mistake right. or a crime? Crimes, if those are cancelable offenses, then God can do whatever God wants to. But I think what God wanted was for Jesus to be born from that line. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is, in this sense, a pro you don't want to call Jesus a product of grace. Jesus needs no grace, but you know what I right. mean? If yeah. God is not gracious and you can plug me for your uh, Calvin pods, if God is not providential over this, we don't get Jesus. Yeah. When I think for me, when I read Matthew 1, 1 through 17, that genealogy, the thing that always sticks out to me is that Jesus is not in need of grace, but he comes from a lineage that needed a whole lot. There are women in there that are time and time and time again, somehow connected to sexual or physical or emotional abuse. Um, mm -hmm. even, even down to Rahab, you know, people don't talk about it because she's the prostitute, but when the spies show up, she identifies them as Israelites how does she know that they're Israelites? Because at least in the narrative of Genesis, the sign of the covenant is circumcision. Mm. So how does she know? Oh, yeah. well, maybe they went there for her services. There's mm. nothing else that can identify them as Israelites. Mm. Um, you know, you have all these narratives there. We talked about Ruth who has the history of being a Moabite. We talked about Bathsheba. Ruth was Tamar. double worthless. I don't mean to interrupt. Ruth was a Moabite widow. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I read that narrative, I can't not see that Jesus comes from brokenness to show us 
that he understands and identifies with brokenness. If we take this and project our current ideas of cancel culture back onto the text, I think Jesus would go, look, you've missed the entire freaking point. It's all about grace. Mm. Want to talk about Paul? We have time yeah, we to can. talk about Paul. We can. Oh, wait, we'll we're see. on your Baylor account. So we have, are we good? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. We, I think we're at like 50 minutes at this point. But the world's yeah, our good. oyster. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. We can talk. We can talk about Paul and finish up with Paul. I like that. Well, because Paul, I mean, he, whatever we said about Martin Luther, we have to say doubly for Paul. Because yeah. that I know of, you and I are both Gentile Christians. So mm-hmm. we are the direct benefactor of Paul's specific apostolic calling to yep. be a minister to the Gentiles. Yeah, to be before the instrument that, Paul was to the murderer. Gentiles. Yeah, before, before that, that, he was Paul, a murderer. And, you know, even if he didn't kill somebody by his own hand, that, that Luke records that and Saul approved of their killing Stephen. Right. That means he was, if you're thinking like Roman Colosseum, he's given the thumbs down, so to speak, yeah. or the thumbs up. Well, but even Paul second. himself, even Paul himself says in Philippians 3, right? As for zeal, persecutor of the church. Mm-hmm. He Paul, identifies himself in that category. The reason I bring up Paul, and this kind of links back to Christians' willingness to hear apology and remorse. Mm-hmm after these horrible crimes, because Paul's was not inadvertent. His was a crime against Christians. And I still remember sitting in in constructive theology. This was this past spring. Uh, So about a year ago today, actually, was when I would have been in these classes. And Dr. Bender, I don't even remember how we got here, but he said, uh, Dr. Kimlin Bender, for those who don't know, is, in my opinion, the most brilliant professor at Truett Seminary. (laughs) If any other Truett Seminary professors watch this, then I don't know if they do, fight me. That's how I feel. (laughs) Um, He sat back in his chair and he's got this kind of like introverted mannerism and he just goes, I don't think Paul ever forgot what he did to Stephen. And he just said that like this matter of fact thing, but I just remembered being like, oh my gosh, I have never thought of that in my life. So I told you before we started this pod, I think that was Paul's thorn in his side. I mean, think about if you're the person that says that Paul was, that they were like dragging people out of their homes. So they're separating families. He watched them stone Stephen to death and watch him rock at a time, break down and lose his life. And then imagine trying to forget those memories and those sounds and those screams and those beggings for mercy I think Paul never forgot that. And I think that was perhaps his thorn in the side. That's not my hill to die on. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, but he calls himself in first Corinthians chapter 15, when he talks about the order in which Jesus appeared to people after he rose from the grave, he says, and lastly, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, you know, the Greek, I know the Greek. Anybody who doesn't know the Greek, what I've told folks is that that is a highly censored interpretation of that text. Can I, can I explain what it is literally, or will we have to mess with the like explicit? No, you will. You can, you can. Okay. So how, however you want it, he could be saying as to a stillborn child. So a child born dead, even more graphically, he could be referring to as an aborted child, Jesus appeared to him, but, Paul's remorse for his crimes is such that he, in this scene, depicts himself in the most graphic, vile language that he can use to say how unworthy he felt. And the reason he felt so unworthy was because of the crimes he committed against Christianity. Yeah. I think if Paul did that today, we would just think he was using inflated rhetoric to try to make us feel sorry for him. Yeah. It may be a bit of an overstatement, but the point is one of the glaring deficiencies of cancel culture is its low tolerance for remorse. Yeah. We just assume that it's coming from a disingenuous place. The burden of proof is on the person who's apologizing. <laughs> yeah. Prove to me you're sorry. As if we're, you know, we make ourselves these little G gods over these people who like demand penitence to be appeased. Right. Um, but Paul carries his remorse with him for the rest of his ministry. Yeah. 
Yeah, we we can't miss that. Of of all the people, you know, we don't know how many people Paul had killed or what role he had in shutting down the efforts of the church as long as he was a pharisaical leader. We we don't know, we can't know. But at least for Paul, a number of different times, he seems to be overwhelmingly grief stricken for his role in those acts. Um, And dare I say, the only comparable that we have for the activity of Paul is some of the things that we saw ISIS doing. And And they ain't sorry. Yeah, they're not sorry. And so when we put it in that perspective, it's hard to miss what what actually Paul was doing. Similar culture, similar violent out like outbreaks in regards to Christians, all the things that we see ISIS doing, that's the closest equivalent we have to say this is also what Paul was doing. Mm. Yeah, Paul's not Paul's not the dude that we're going Yep, he's our poster child, except when he is. Right. Yeah. And the irony in bringing up Paul is that many people, some Christians, have canceled Paul for less. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I can't help help myself. Uh, Yeah, lots of people, they've canceled Paul for much less than murder. Um, Yeah. But truly, if we canceled Paul, if we decided that the buck stops in the early chapters of Acts where he does this to Stephen— uh, chapter seven or eight, excuse me. Um, then we don't get a third of the new Testament. Um, we, particularly the letter to the Romans, which has been, that has so shaped at least Western theology. Um, and yeah. And we just don't exist. God can do whatever he wants to. Maybe he appoints other, uh, ministers to the Gentiles, but Paul's the guy that's that is the work for which he was separated for from before he was born, as he puts it in Galatians. Yeah. Um, so if we cancel him, besides all the other petulant reasons that people cancel Paul, those notwithstanding, if we cancel right. him for this not so petulant reasons, we are like sheep without a shepherd in one regard, as far as understanding our faith in the in and outs of our lives, which are what the epistles kind of exist to do. We still get Jesus. We always still get Jesus. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord for Jesus. Um, praise Jesus for Jesus. Right. Uh, <laughs> but not having Paul, we'd be in trouble. So I bring up, and like I said, these are three of arguably the four most important people in Scripture, bar God, the yeah. triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, and they all committed cancelable offenses and are an integral part of the biblical story. They are an integral part of my faith and your faith and our existence of people of faith. And if we're comfortable not canceling them, all the while holding their crimes and the balance with their contributions, it it is important that we try as best as we are able to extend that grace forward the same way we extend that grace backward.